Hello, I'm Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we'll be looking at Unit 6, Lesson Number 9 on modeling with quadratic functions. So, we played around a lot with quadratic functions, their graphs, parabolas, all sorts of things. We've seen the zero product law, a variety of different factoring techniques. And today, what we're going to look at is just a few applications that involve quadratic functions. Um, it's good to understand where these functions get used in terms of modeling things in the real world, and that's what we're going to tackle today. Make sure to have your TI graphing calculators handy because we'll be using those quite a bit, and let's launch right into it. All right, exercise one. An object is fired upwards with an initial velocity of 112 feet per second. Its height, in feet above the ground, as a function of time, in seconds since it was fired, is given by this equation. So again, make sure that you understand always when you're given an equation what it represents. You know, inputs, outputs, right? The t, the time, input, is the number of seconds since it was fired. And the output, h, is the height it is above the ground. Ah, in feet above the ground. Letter A is simple enough. It asks us, well, at what height was the object fired? Well, we know that when the object was fired, t must have been equal to zero. So if I evaluate h of zero, and I get negative 16 times zero squared plus 112 times zero, I find zero. So it was fired at a height of zero feet. Now, uh, that's kind of important. Objects can be higher, fired at ground level, but they could also be fired off of the top of a building or I suppose even conceivably below ground level. You know, if you had like a missile in a silo or something like that. Don't assume that it's being fired off at ground level. Just plug in t equals zero. Now letter B says sketch a general curve of this equation below. All right, well, think about this for a moment. What do we know at this point? Because I want to sketch a little t versus h. Well, we know it starts right here, right? At zero seconds, at zero feet above the ground. Because it is a negative leading coefficient, it's got to be a concave down parabola. So it's got to look something like this, right? And that's as good of a sketch as I need right now, okay? Letter C asks us to algebraically find the time that the rocket reaches its greatest height and the maximum height. We want to know this. Right? We want to know when does it reach its maximum height and what was its maximum height. Now we can do this with a variety of different methods. We could do this using completing the square, but I'd like to actually use a formula we had in the last lesson, which was negative b divided by 2a. Now we don't have any x's in this problem. Our input variable is t, or time. So let's use that. Um, b is 112, so negative b is negative 112. a is negative 16. Put all that in. If you need to, we could have negative 112 divided by negative 32. And after all is said and done, let's see if I can get on the right page. I was on the back side of the sheet we find that's 3.5. Now this is important. 3.5 what? Ah, 3.5 seconds. Okay, so that tells me the answer to this question mark. What it doesn't tell me is the answer to this one. But of course to actually find the height, that is the whole point of the function itself. We just would want to know h of 3.5. Now again, we don't even necessarily need to show this step, but just to emphasize where I'm getting my answer, I wanted to show it. Right? What is important is to show this. Show. But ultimately, we crank through all this and we get 196. 196 what? Ah, feet. So at its maximum height, the object is 196 feet above the ground. Now finally, letter D asks us to algebraically determine the time when the rocket reaches the ground. Label this on your graph. Well, at the ground, right, h is equal to zero. So really, what I'm looking to do is solve this equation. 
Now, since it's a quadratic, we want to use the zero product law if we can. We already have it equal to zero. Maybe I'll factor out a GCF. I can pull out a T. Um, I can actually also pull out a negative 16. That may not be obvious. You might need to play around with that. And quite frankly, you could just pull out the T. You wouldn't even have to pull out the GCF. You could just pull out a common factor. But if I pull out a negative 16, I'll be left with T minus 7. That kind of sounded funny. So I'll set this equal to 0 and divide both sides by negative 16 and get t equals 0. But that really just corresponds to this. And then, of course, if I say t minus 7 equals 0, that is when it hits the ground. Now, if you're heads up, of course, you know it's t equals 7 without doing that work based on two things. Two things. Number one, the turning point is at 3.5. And number two, it starts off at zero. That's really important. A lot of students, if you got some object flying through the air, that kind of problem, will assume that the time that it takes for it to hit the ground will simply be double the amount of time that it takes to reach its highest point. And don't get me wrong, that will always be true if you fire it from ground level, because the amount of time it takes to go up is the same as the amount of time it takes to come down. On the other hand, and I'm going to draw this in red because it's not really part of the problem. On the other hand, if we were firing from somewhere other than ground surface, then it would take us less time to get to the top than it would to get to the bottom. Okay? So pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, I'm going to clear out the text. Let's take a look at another problem. Ah, there's a lot of things in the world that have shapes of parabolas or shapes similar enough to parabolas that they can be modeled using a parabola. And a skateboard half pipe ramp is a good example, right? You guys have seen these things. I've got a park by, by my house. My son likes to skateboard. You know, you got these things where the skateboarder is kind of going up and down, right? So we're going to model one of those using this equation. It looks pretty messy because of all the decimals, but let's take a look. Um, x represents the horizontal distance. X represents the horizontal distance across the 20-foot wide half pipe. And Y represents the ramp's height above the ground in feet. It says, with the help of your calculator, all right, we'll get that out in a second, sketch a graph of the half pipe below. Label its height at its endpoints and at its minimum point. All right. So, well, we can definitely kind of kind of get a feeling for this. But before before we do that, let's actually get some some values. At x equals zero, we find that y is equal to seven. All right, and I, I can actually easily tell that from this equation. Now, if this is well designed, it's perfectly symmetric, and at x equals twenty. If we plug that into the equation, we'd also get y equals 7. And I'm doing this to give myself sort of a general idea of the graphing window. So let's, let's bring out the TI-84+. plus. Let's take a look. All right, there's my calculator. Let's go into y equals. Clear out any equations you might have in there. I'll do the same. All right, now let's very carefully put that one in. Watch out, that's 0.06, not 0.6. So let's do 0.06x squared minus 1.2x plus 7. All right, take a look. And again, make sure it's 0.06, not 0.6. That would be an easy mistake. Looks good. All right, let's set the window. Let's go into our window. Now I'm going to set my x minimum to be 0, and I suppose I'll set my x maximum to be 20. Now I don't think it hurts to set my y minimum at 0. I don't think the half pipe is going to go underneath the ground, but we would be able to tell that from the graph if, if it does. And y maximum, maybe I'll set that at 10. I mean, I know that it's only going up to 7, but let's set it at 10. Okay, look at your window, make sure it looks good. It does, so let's hit graph. All right, look at that. That's a cool parabola. Let's let's uh, let's do a little graphing here. 
we're going to do this. Give me some axes. All right, maybe we got here to 20. All right up here at 10. And it looks like this. Okay, probably should have made it dip down lower. That was my mistake. Okay, obviously we've got that height of seven. Okay. We can also label it over here, 20 comma seven. I think the only question is this thing. All right, we could use the minimum command on our calculator, uh, but we could also just evaluate our half pint, our half pint, our half pipe at x equals 10. And if we do that, what we find is we find a height of only one feet of fo foot above the ground. So again, I should have probably made this come down a little bit farther for scale purposes. But that's it. All right. It's kind of neat. Okay, pause the video now and write down anything you need to. All right, let's clear it out. Now, on the back side of the sheet, ooh, we got a problem, okay? Now, we're going to need our calculators on this. So, you know, we're going to keep the TI-84 Plus nice and handy, okay? We might make it kind of small, but then we'll make it big again when we need it. So let's go on to the next problem. All right, exercise number three. Lots of reading here. The Crazy Caramel Corn Company, sorry, has determined that the percentage of kernels that pop rises and then falls as the temperature of the oil the kernels are cooked in increases. It modeled this trend using the equation, blah, I'm not going to read it all out, but here it is. Now again, let's make sure we get it. P is the percent of the kernels that pop, and T is the temperature of the cooking oil. Right? So if you've ever cooked popcorn in oil, as opposed to, let's say, having it in a bag in the microwave, which is perfectly good, too. We love that in the Weiler household. Um, but if you pop it in oil, there's some oil temperatures that are just, you know, that are too cold, and there are some that are too hot, right? And so, therefore, there's some optimal temperature. Um, and, in fact, that's what letter A is. It says, algebraically determine the temperature at which the highest percentage of kernels pop also determine the percent of kernels that pop at this temperature. Well, so in other words, you know, I don't know exactly what this looks like. We're going to produce a graph eventually, but, you know, the, 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 the thing goes up and goes down. I, I, I want to know this, right? I want to know what temperature I should be popping at and what percentage I'll have pop. So I'm actually going to use my negative B divided by 2A. Very nice here. I definitely don't want to use vertex form. <laughs> That would be a beast to do completing the square on this, but I'll do negative 2.8, right? That's negative B, divided by 2 times negative 1 250th, because that's A. All right, and again, that's pretty ugly, but if you're confident on your calculator and you're comfortable with it, what you'll find is that that works out to be 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, that's the temperature when we get the optimal popping, Right, 350. But what we want to know is also the percentage of the kernels that pop. Well, again, that's just an issue of putting that 350 into the equation. I'm not going to show you the substitution. It's whatever, you know, putting 350 there, putting 350 there. Being very careful, cranking through all of that, what you end up finding is 96%. So at best, we're not going to get 100% of those kernels to pop, but at a 350 degree Fahrenheit temperature, 96% are going to pop. All right. Now letter B, it says, using your calculator, sketch a curve below for P greater than or equal to zero. Label your window. Now let, let, before we do that, let's, let's think about this for a minute. What are they saying here? Using your calculator, sketch a curve below for p greater than or equal to zero. Label your window. Well, this makes sense, right? We, you can't have negative percents. Okay, you, you just can't. Um, not, not at least in this problem. Um, so what we're really saying is I want to be able to look at a graph of the percent versus temperature for when the percents are greater than zero. So let's put this thing into our calculator and... Whew, let's play around with it. Um, so let, let's do it. This is going to be a little bit complex, but let's go into y equals. 
And let's clear out anything that we have in there. All right, let's put this in. Negative 1 divided by 250. I have to use x times x squared plus 2.8x minus 394. Now, ooh, what do I know about this? Do I know anything that's going to help me with the window? Well, I do know that my minimum percentage would be 0 and my maximum percentage would be 100. Although, quite frankly, I didn't get it. My, my biggest percent's 96. Okay, but still, you know, 0 to 100, not bad. Now, that's the, actually the y-axis. What about the x-axis? I mean, that, you know, well, we do know we have the optimal at 350. So we could do, we could double that. We could say uh, 0 to 700. Well, let's, let, let's see how that works. Okay, let's go into our window. And I think I'm going to include a little bit of negative on the percent, uh, which seems silly. But, but first, let's do our x window, which is the temperatures. Let's put the minimum temperature at 0. Let's put the maximum temperature at 750. We can always change this window if we need to. Okay. Now, the y's, those are the percentages. I'm going to actually include a little bit negative just so I can see below that axis. So let me put negative 10 as my y min. Let's put 100 as my y max. Okay, make sure everything looks good. While you're making sure everything looks good, I'm going to draw some axes. Okay, and now let's hit the graph button. All right. Well, I don't need to draw any of the area that is below the x-axis. In fact, maybe I'll even kind of label it like this, T, P, 100, 700, and then I see something that kind of looks like this. All right, terrible looking parabola, but I'll live with it. Right, the percentage of the kernels that are being popped, or that are popping, is increasing up to a point, and of course we, we know what point this is. This is 350 comma 96. They're increasing up to a point, then they're decreasing. Now letter C says, using the zero command on your calculator, determine to the nearest degree the two temperatures at which P is equal to zero. So we could do this algebraically, but it would get very ugly. I'm just drawing those in dashed. Um, so let's use the zero command. All right. On the calculator, let's go to calculate. All right, let's go to zero. Hit enter. Now again, the zero command is one that some people struggle with. So what we're going to do is we're going to find that, that the smaller of the two zeros, then we're going to have you find the larger of them. But what we're going to do is select that zero command. Now it says, you know, right sort of left bound. So I put my cursor, hit my cursor as many times as I need to until I'm confident that it's to the left of the zero I'm looking to find. All right? And then I hit enter. Now it asks for a right bound, so I gotta move the cursor to the right of the zero that I'm looking for, and hit enter. Then it asks for a guess. Now again, uh, I just need to move that cursor closer to the one that I, to the zero I'm looking for, rather than the zero I'm not yet looking for, and hit enter. And it looks like we have temperature of 195 to the nearest degree. What I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to use the zero command to find the larger one. All right. Hopefully, you found 505. Now, think about this for a second. This is kind of cool. It means for any temperature below 195 or above 505, no popcorn's going to pop. But as soon as you get above 195 and below 505, then you're going to have kernels pop. Now, letter D. If a typical batch of popcorn consists of 800 kernels, how many does the Crazy Caramel Corn Company <laughs> expect to pop at the optimal temperature? This is actually a pretty easy percent problem, but it's a nice one to throw in, so think about this for a minute. 
Well, we know at the optimal, optimal temperature, which is this one, 96% of the kernels pop. So some pretty basic work, 0.96 times 800. And we get 768. All right. Now there's one last part of this problem, which is kind of cool because it's going to involve an inequality. But we're going to look at that on the next screen. So pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, let's clear out the text. And let's do one more problem. Okay, for a batch of popcorn to be successful, the company wants at least 85% of its kernels to pop. All right, okay, great. Write an inequality, write an inequality. This is important. Write an inequality whose solution represents all temperatures that would ensure a successful batch. Solve this inequality graphically to the nearest degree and show your graph below labeling all relevant points. All right, well, first things first, pause the video and write down the inequality that we have to solve. All right, well, the company wants at least 85% of its kernels to pop. In other words, P must be greater than or equal to 85, or better yet, negative one over 250 T squared plus 8.8 T, 2.8 T, sorry, minus 394 must be greater than or equal to 85. So this is what I'm trying to solve. Okay. So how do I solve this graphically? Well, I'm going to do a little sketch of the graph that we already had, but I'm going to leave some things out. Okay. I think I would like to have the 195 on there and the 505. And I think I'll even put on my, my turning point, which is uh, 350, 96. But now what I want you to do, and I'll do this as well, is we're going to put this thing in Y2. So let's do that. Make sure that our calculator is nice and big. All right, let's go back into Y equals. And in Y2, I'm going to put down 85. Okay. Don't change anything else. Just in Y2, we have 85. In fact, let's keep the exact same window and hit graph. All right, and now what we see is we see this line. Now that's the y equals 85 line. And what we want to do is find those intersection points. So what I'd like you to do is use the intersect command and find the intersection points of those, of those two graphs. Pause the video for a minute or two. All right. Well, this intersection point is at 298, comma, no great surprise, 85. And this one is at 402, 85. Now keep in mind, what we really want though, is we want all of this because Everywhere in here, we had at least 85% pop, and we went all the way up to 96. So our final answer is really quite simple. T greater than or equal to 298, less than or equal to 350. All right? No, not less than or equal to 350. That's weird. How about 402? Here I'm looking at that 350 up above and just going on too much autopilot, 402, right? Any temperature between 298 and 402 will get us at least 85 because it will put us in this area, right? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I think we'll put away the TI-84+. plus. Why don't you pause the video now, write down anything you need to. All right, let's clear the text out and finish up the lesson. Parabolas, which then of course are described by quadratic functions, model the shape of lots of things in the real world, whether it's a half pipe 
whether it's the optimal popping of, of kernels, even let's say a suspended cable, right? All of these things have shapes that are either parabolas or close enough to parabolas that we can model them with quadratic functions. All right, and then the important features of those functions like the zeros or the turning points can be found either algebraically or graphically. All right, well, thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.